All right, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, my name is uh, Doug Storm. I'm one of the uh, pediatric urologists at the University of Iowa. Um, and I would like to thank uh, the folks from uh, UCSF for the opportunity to um, present uh, this evening then. Um, you know, the intent of this talk is not necessarily to dive into the, my, my way of um, doing surgery to treat the undescended testicle, but instead then to sort of talk about sort of the science and sort of the history that sort of uh, defines our current management of the undescended testicle. All right, so I have, uh, I have no financial disclosures and uh, the opinions expressed here are then are gonna be my own. Um, so in terms of the undescended testicle, uh, this is gonna be the most common uh, male pediatric endocrine disorder then. But despite its frequency, really the etiology is still poorly understood. And we as surgeons then, we should be quite happy because if a, a undescended testicle remains persistently undescended, undescended then the treatment of choice is going to be surgery. But certainly um, the long-term implications regarding possible fertility concerns, as well as association with testicular cancer are things we have to keep in mind. Yeah, but first I think we start off with the history lesson and I thoroughly believe that if we don't understand history, then we are bound to repeat it. And so really and truly back in the medieval times, it was first recognized that a man should have two fully descended testicles. And this was actually used to confirm that a cardinal who was elected to ascend to the Pope was truly a man. And what he would do is he would actually sit on a chair, which is pictured here, and he would dangle his scrotum through a hole in the chair. And somebody who got to be the lucky examiner put their hand in there and examined to make sure that he had two fully descended testicles. And if they did, he stated in Latin then that he has two testicles and they dangle, dangle nicely and he was allowed to then ascend to, the, to, to being a pope. In 1755 then, uh, Baron Albert von Haler then published the, sort, of, sort of the first surgical atlas um, discussing, discussing the undescended testicle. And he was the first to really um, understand the, the congenital hernia and also describe the abdominal position then of the fetal testis as well then. He postulated sort of the normal testicular descent, and despite having rumored never being, never actually performing surgery on a living person, he really is the forefather um, of the undescended testicle and really piqued the interest of future surgeons regarding cryptorchism. John Hunter then is one of the fathers of modern surgery and truly then one of the fathers then of, of the undescended testicle. And you can see here that cryptorchidism actually means hidden testicle. Um, he was the first to really confirm the abdominal position of the fetal testicle and actually worked to um, understand how the testicle actually descends into the scrotum by understanding the neurovascular supply as well as the cremester and the gubernaculum. And on post-mortem studies, he identified that the testicle typically descends into the scrotum by the eighth, uh, by the eighth uh, gestational month then. He was the first to use the tomb gubernaculum, which actually means Helmer rudder. And he believed this was the structure then which, to, which allowed for a normal testicular descent. He was ahead of his time and actually further described what it meant to have a, other, other reasons why the testicle may not be in the scrotum, which would include retractile testicles as well as testicular ectopia then. And he actually was the first to describe that after a period of observation, if the testicle didn't spontaneously descend after birth, that they should be treated surgically. In 1871 then, the, the first attempted orchid apexy was performed. And this actually was attempted as an outpatient, which is, which is a pretty big feat in 1871. Unfortunately, this child developed a wound infection on post-operative um, post day number three, and eventually died secondary to uh, peritonitis. But the autopsy was actually performed and identified that the peritonitis had commenced um, in the tunica vaginalis and then had ascended upward. And this was the, at the first time when the recognition of ligating the patent processes vaginalis was validated. In 1877, so the first successful orchid apexy was performed by Thomas Annandale, who is pictured here on the left. And he, um, he had the advantage of actually having an, an antiseptic technique so that his patient was actually able to survive the, the surgery. 
1881, then Max Schuller described the division of the process as vaginalis then. And in 1899, Dean Brevin um, actually brought this technique to the United States. And he further described actually dissecting the peritone or the spermatic vessels into the retroperitoneum in order to, to in order to gain more length to the testicle to bring it to the dependent portion of the scrotum. Um, and he, in 1918, he, he reported his um, case series of over 400 cases and actually had a 95% success rate. In 1957, John Latimer, for which one of our lectures um, in pediatric urology is so named, he actually described the, the creation of the subductor's pouch. And Robert Prentice, who we all know um, for the Prentice maneuver, which is pictured here at the very bottom of the slide, you know, he identified that the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. And so by dividing the inferior epigastric vessels, then he, we could gain some increased length in order to bring the testicles to the scrotum. And it's interesting that all, all of these play upon the common theme then of really bringing the testicle to the scrotum in a tension-free manner with good blood supply, which are things that we still practice to this day. In terms of looking at the history of an unascended testicle and, and its hist and his histology and physiology, in 1916, Daniel um, Eisendrath, um, he actually advocated, he was the first to, one of the first to advocate a really early surgery, which by his definition was anywhere after two years of age if the testicle hasn't spontaneously descended because he noted actually atrophy of the spermatic tubules if the, tes if the testicle was left undescended. And, in Car and then in 1924, Carl Moore actually recognized that, that an increased temperature, which is associated with leaving the testicle within the abdomen, also resulted in testicular degeneration. And he performed animal nodules demonstrating that if he brought the testicle then down to the scrotum, that the degeneration was reversed and the function returned. So skipping ahead here, you know, we see lots of children in the office um, for, for not having a testicle down in the scrotum. And really and truly, there's, there's a, a lot of reasons why this could occur. Uh, number one is that we could have our standard undescended testicle. And really and truly, that's defined as a testicle that's never been down in the scrotum. You could also have an ectopic testicle, which is where a testicle took a wrong turn on its way down to the scrotum. A retractile testicle is, is a testicle which was fully descended, but then developed a hyperactive premaxeric reflex, which caused a testicle re to retract into the inguinal canal. Whereas you have an ascending, or some people def define this as a gliding testicle then. And again, that's a testicle that had spontaneously descended, but then over time got pulled up into the inguinal canal. And then an acquired testicle is like an ascending testicle, except that this is secondary to a previous groin surgery where that scar causes that testicle to, to ascend into the inguinal canal. And it's important to note that all of this is guided by our history and our physical examination then. In terms of classifying the undescended testicle, this is all based upon our physical examination and the position where the testicle had arrested. So 80% of these testicles are palpable, which can either be in the suprascrotal region or the inguinal region. 20% of them can be non-palpable, which, which would mean that the testicle is either intra-abdominal or 30 to 60% of these, of these non-palpable testicles may actually be a vanishing testicle, meaning that it had formed and then something happened to it, or, or resulting in a testicular nubbin, or it could be that the testicle just never formed properly. In terms of looking at unilateral versus bilateral, um, only about 2% of cases are actually bilateral. And then also you can have an ectopic testicle, which means again that the testicle was on its way to the inguinal canal, but it ended up in a different location. And you can see down here that you have a child with an undescended uh, right testicle. And on physical examination then, the, this patient's uh, testicle was found in the, uh, just, just adjacent to the, uh, to the scrotum, which is gonna be the most common location for an ectopic testicle to occur. In terms of defining the retractile testicle, again, this is all based upon our physical examination then. So this is gonna be a child with an overactive cremasteric reflex. When you examine um, these children, what happens is you can identify the testicle within the inguinal canal, but you can bring it to the dependent portion of the, of the, of the scrotum where it remains. Uh, these patients do not necessarily require surgery, but typically I follow them on an annual basis until the testicle is no longer retractile. 
The reason to do that is about five to 10% of these individuals will develop an ascending testicle, which would then require surgery. In terms of the ascending testicle, again, these are testicles which were documented to have descended at birth then. Later on in life then, the pediatrician identifies that they've ascended into the inguinal canal. On these patients, you're able to, uh, again, palpate the testicle within the scrotum, or excuse me, within the inguinal, inguinal canal. You can bring it to the scrotum, but it immediately retracts. This will occur in about 2, for, two, per, two to 4% of all boys and should be treated with your standard orchid apexy. And again, acquired uh, crypt, or, crypt orchidism occurs uh, secondary to prior inguinal surgery then. Oftentimes, we'll see this in children who had a prior inguinal hernia repair. Again, when you examine these patients, you're not able to bring the testicle to the scrotum. And again, this requires surgical treatment. So in order to understand the science behind an unascended testicle, we really have to understand how a normal testicle develops and then descends. And so until week seven of gestation, the gonad remains undifferentiated. And then what happens at week seven then is, it, is that we have the SRY, which is on the short arm of the Y chromosome, that acts upon the uh, undifferentiated uh, gonad and it differentiates into the testicle. That further induces then this, uh, the development of the Sertoli cells, which the Sertoli cells then produce a malarian inhibiting substance then, which allows the malarian ducts to degenerate then. And about week eight then, the Leydig cells, which had developed then, start to, be, start to produce testosterone then, which then um, allow the Wolfian duct development and this in conjunction then with the malarian in inhibiting substance then results in normal development of the male internal genitalia, which is evident usually by week 10 to 13. In terms of the testicular descent, there's really two phases of this. And uh, the first um, phase is going to be the int intra-abdominal stage then. And this will occur between weeks 10 to, 10 to 23 of gestation. And this is under both hormonal and mechanical control. And the, the uh, most important hormone here is going to be the insulin-like insulin hormone, which is seen here. And what that does is that uh, acts upon the relaxin family peptide 2 receptor, which is expressed on the gubernaculum, which you can see here. And that causes that gubernaculum then to contract which brings the testicle down over the urogenital ridge and into the, um, inguinal, in, in, into the inguinal region then. And also at this time point, uh, the gubernaculum then also develops as well. And you can see the gubernaculum here as well, which is going to shorten in response then to um, these hormones. We then have the second stage of testicular descent, which occurs between um, 24 to 34 weeks of gestation and this is termed the androgen dependent phase then because it's mostly dependent upon testosterone, which is seen here. And what happens then is that testosterone is produced and that acts upon the genital femoral nerve then, which is going to see, be seen here. And that releases then the uh, calcitonin gene related peptide then. And that will cause contractions of the gubernaculum then, which allows the testicle then to move from the abdomen and in, into the inguinal canal then. This allows the processes vaginalis then to elongate, which creates a pathway for that testicle to descend, hopefully into the dependent portion of the, uh, of the scrotum. And the testis is also pushed by some changes in the intra-abdominal pressure as well. And you can see here that this is the gubernaculum, which is, which is recessing then, pulling the testicle down into the scrotum. If we look at the epidemiology as well as the risk factors for um, an undescended testicle, <clears throat> so an undescended testicle will occur in about two to 5% of all full-term males. It's going to be more common than in premature infants and typically is, is stated to occur in about 30% of all premature infants then. Typically, uh, so there is a very high likelihood of the testicle spontaneously, spontaneously descending. This will occur in about three quarters of the cases but as we all know, if they, if they are going to spontaneously descend, this typically will occur by two to four months of age. So that by one year, about 0.8 to 1% of all full-term males um, uh, have a um, persistent undescended testicle, whereas about 10% of all preterm males at one year of age will have a persistent undescended testicle. 
They did, if you look at historical studies, there appear to be an increased incidence of an undescended testicle within the 70s and 80s that seemed to have leveled out. People hypothesize that there could be some lifestyle factors as well as some environmental factors that occurred during these decades, which uh, resulted in an increased incidence, but really and truly this, this is still unfounded. In terms of risk factors then for having an undescended testicle, if, you're, if adv ad advanced maternal age seems to play, be a risk factor, maternal, maternal obesity with, um, and this is thought to be secondary to an increased estrogen effect, may also be a risk factor, low parity, premature birth as we previously discussed, low birth weight, which goes along with having premature birth, and in infants less than 900 grams, about, there's about 100% incidence of having an undescended testicle. And there are other environmental um, uh, factors and, and certainly some prenatal exposure to some things which can also um, maybe result in an undescended testicle. And we'll touch upon those a little bit further here. If we look at genetic risk factors, um, so this was a, a study out of, Den, uh, out of Denmark and Finland, which was, a, which was evaluating undescended testicles as a possible cause for decreased um, semen quality as well as increased testicular cancer in men from Denmark. So they thought that maybe um, a history of cryptorchism could play a role in here. So they evaluated over a thousand Danish and over 1400 Finnish uh, uh, boys from Finland. And what they found is at birth, there was a starkingly um, increased incidence of uh, an undescended testicle in boys from Denmark as compared to boys from Finland. And this persisted then at three months of age. And after they adjusted for confounding factors then, um, again, um, they found a, uh, an odds ratio then of about 4.4 with a significant, uh, with a significantly higher of under, significant higher level of undescended testicles in boys from Denmark as con as compared to boys from Finland, and this persisted then at three months of age. So, if you look at a map here, Denmark and Finland are really not all that far from one another. They're only about 900 miles from one another. So, really and truly, I'm not sure that geography is playing a role here, and they and they surmise the same. And they thought that there could be certain environmental factors then in the Danish boys, which could result in a higher rate of undescended testicles in these boys, which could then result in downstream issues in men, which, we, which they were finding. They didn't necessarily um, comment on what endocrine disruptors or lifestyle changes this could be, but, uh, but there, this is some evidence that that certainly could play a role. If we look at other genetic factors which, which could cause an undescended testicle, there was this study which was performed which uh, sought to determine the frequency of genetic alterations in boys with a history of an undescended testicle. And what they looked at was over 600 males with a history of an undescended testicle and compared these to 300 controls then. Overall then they found a very low incidence of having a genetic mutation at around 3%. And, and this is sort of an all comers then. So not only this would be men, or excuse me, boys where the, where the testicle was undescended at birth and then spontaneously descended, as well as boys with a history of a persistent undescended testicle. But what you can see here is that if there was a persistent undescended testicle, there was a higher rate of having a, a, a genetic mutation. Uh, and this is especially in the unilateral boys as seen here, but is even increased then in boys with a history of persistent bilateral undescended testicles. So if you had an undescended testicle, this is all comers then, there was about a 17-fold greater likelihood of having a genetic mutation. And uh, the, unfortunately, there's a large number of genetic, genetic mutations which can play a role here, but the most common genetic uh, findings then was that there was eight cases then, a sort of a Klinefelter type of syndrome then, and also five cases then in the insulin-like um, uh, receptor gene, which we previously discussed uh, that, imp that, that the importance of this, uh, of this hormone in terms of normal testicular descent. And if we look closer then um, at a study which, which uh, looked at, um, which looked at um, abnormalities in, in the insulin uh, INSL3 and uh, hormone as well as this receptor then, <clears throat> This, uh, this study found that there was about a 4.7% uh, percent mutation frequency in men with a history of an undescended testicle. Now you would think that if there was a mutation in this that all these men would have um, 
you know, bilateral um, unascended testicles, but really and truly there's variable phenotypes which were, which were expressed in these men. And that can, that can be anywhere from a boy who had an unascended testicle at birth and then it spontaneously descended, or this could be a, a boy with two bilateral intra-abdominal unascended testicles. Uh, but it is clear that, 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 uh, that um, differences in, in these genes or alterations in these genes can certainly play a role in um, boys with a history of an unascended testicle. Other associated conditions, so we all know that children with some abdominal wall defects, which would include, which, which would include prune belly syndrome, as well as omphalocele, then they have a higher likelihood of having an undescended testicle. Um, children with a history of spina bifida also have an increased risk for developing an undescended testicle. Uh, cerebral palsy also carries a substantial increased risk. And then obviously disorders of sexual uh, development and other genetic disorders um, can also play a role here as well. So certainly genetics does play a role, but I don't think that, I don't think it explains um, everything for us. Getting towards um, the role that some environmental factors uh, may, may play, um, there is what's called a testicular dis, uh, dysgenesis hypothesis. And this first came about in 2001. And um, this researcher felt that certain environmental compounds, um, which either act as estrogens or sort of anti-androgens, uh, will play a role on the fetal gonad which can then help explain um, the development of um, hypospadias and unnecessary testicle, uh, as well as testicular cancer and impaired sperm development. So he thought that, that one, um, one common um, uh, outside, uh, outside factor could actually explain the development of all of these things. And you can see this here where you know, there's environmental exposures and other outside factors in which act upon the Sertoli cells, the Leydig cell, as, as well as the fetal germ cells. What this leads to is to, uh, testicular dysgenesis, which is decreased Leydig cell function as well as decreased Sertoli cell function. This can result in the increased production of, of the INSL3, which results in the undescended testicle. You can also have decreased androgens, which then may lead to hypospadias. Um, as well as issues with, uh, with the spermatogenesis then. And in terms of the uh, decreased Sertoli cell then, this could lead to issues with, again, increased spermatogenesis, as well as an increased risk for developing testicular cancer, as well as the gonadoblastoma. Um, other studies have identified uh, potential players in terms of endocrine disruptors, which may play a role in developing an unascended testicle, and this includes diethylsilvestrol, some uh, and as well as maternal obesity, which we previously discussed, and also interestingly, um, smokers have an odds ratio uh, have a higher likelihood of developing an unascended testicle, as well as uh, mothers uh, who consume alcohol during pregnancy, that also uh, increases the risk for their son having an unascended testicle as well. In terms of evaluating the unascended testicle, this is something we all do on a routine basis, but certain things that you can certainly look for then is, you know, looking at this child, you can tell that that left hemiscrotum has never quite developed. And you can see this certainly in, in, older, in older children as well, so that you can, you can fairly reliably say that that testicle has never been down in the scrotum then. Um, in addition, then you can um, sometimes identify inguinal fullness then if there is a, a communicating hydrocele. And just like everything else in pediatric urology, if you had to guess the, the predominant side for this to occur on, uh, it predominantly occurs on the left-hand side. In terms of examining the, the child with, an, uh, with concern for an undescended testicle, a lot of times if they're a little bit older, you can place them in the frog leg position, and this may make it easier, especially if you're evaluating them for a retractile testicle. Um, again, you begin your palpation at the um, ASIS then, and then sweep inferiorly then. And it's always a good idea when you're evaluating for an unascended testicle, especially if you have a non-palpable unascended testicle, that you check the size and position of the contralateral testicle, because sometimes you will find compensatory hypertrophy, which um, could lead you to believe that, that, left, that, the, uh, that the unascended testicle may not have formed properly. And certainly the AUA guidelines touch upon this where they say that the primary care provider should evaluate the, the quality and position of the testicle in all boys at all well child visits. And certainly we hope that this is something that's practiced. 
In terms of imaging for an unascended testicle, we all know the recent guidelines. We know that ultrasound, CT scan, MRI, uh, they are not considered helpful. And, and their guideline is that they should not perform imaging prior to sending the boys our way. Again, the diagnosis should be made by a physical examination then. So we, we can say that an ultrasound should not be uh, obtained. But um, if we wanna look closer then at why um, imaging should not be obtained, there was this um, meta-analysis which was performed back in 2012 where they um, actually analyzed 18 studies which um, evaluated the use of imaging in order to identify and localize a, a, a non-palpable testicle. And they used surgery here as the reference standard and they evaluated the sensitivity, specificity, as well as the overall accuracy rate of multiple imaging uh, modalities in terms of identifying a non-palpable unascended testicle. And what they found here is if you look at the positive predictive value, and, and this is you know, what they evaluated was ultrasound, MRI, CT, they even found one study which, or, which evaluated, or excuse me, two studies which evaluated the use of an MRA and one which, eva which evaluated the use of a MRV. Overall, the positive predictive value, you know, you not too terribly bad, um, but when you look at the negative predictive value, this is gonna be all over the board. Um, and, and what this results in is an overall accuracy rate of any of these uh, imaging modalities um, being all over the board. And so this sort of documents then the, 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 the um, you know, why uh, we do not obtain any imaging then uh, prior to referral to us and, and actually even prior to, for, uh, uh, for us in terms of proceeding with surgery. So really and truly, why do we worry about an undescended testicle? And it really is for the potential then for um, uh, impaired spermatogenesis, which could lead to decreased fertility down the road, as well as the increased risk for developing testicular cancer. And in terms of identifying how um, having an undescended testicle may impact um, normal spermatogenesis, we really have to understand what happens on a normal basis. And in, a, in the pre pubertal period, there's sort of our two time frames then where the, where, the, uh, the, where the fetal germ cells then sort of begin their development then into, into a, a adult sperm. And the number one is that it occurs at two to three months of age then. And what happens here is that this is where you have disappearance then of the gonocytes then, which is the fetal stem cell pool. And what happens is these then transition into adult and into um, adult dark spermatogonia then. So you notice an increase in that number around two to three months of age. And this coincides then when children sort of go through that mini puberty where they get the surge of testosterone then. And what happens then is that at this time point, you get a reduction then in the total number of germ cells as well. It goes into a quiescent phase, and then around four to five years of age then, this is where we begin to see the appearance then of spermatocytes, and this is all the beginning of meiosis then. We also notice at this time point that you have an increase in, in the AD or adult dark, assuming adult dark spermatogonia then, and we also start to begin an, uh, a, an increase in the total number of germ cells. And then after this period then, the um, typically, um, it goes into a quiescent phase until the, until the uh, boy reaches puberty. But really and truly, we, we need to keep these two stages then in mind as we begin to evaluate the effect um, that an undescended testicle can have on future um, um, sperm development. And so this study is sort of a, a hallmark study which came out of the Children's Hospital of uh, Philadelphia, where they... Um, began to explore abnormalities in germ cell maturation in boys with a history of an unascended testicle. And these would be um, over 700 boys and with a history of a unilateral unascended testicle where they not only biopsied the unascended testicle at the time of an orchid epoxy, but they also biopsied the contralateral descended testicle as well. And you can see that there's a large age, age range um, in terms of the patients which were included in this study. And let's take a look at what they found. So first of all, if we evaluate boys within the first year of life then, what they found is that within the undescended testicle, there, there was a significantly higher number of germ cells. And this is seen down here. 
So the um, under, uh, the boys, so the uh, biopsy from the undescended testicle is represented in the blue bars, whereas the biopsy from the um, from the uh, contralateral descended testicle is represented in the white bars. They also found a significantly higher number of gonocytes. So basically, the transition which was supposed to occur was not occurring. So these fetal germ cells were sticking around. And they, and they found these higher uh, gonocyte counts than in children with a history, or excuse me, in the undescended, in the side that was undescended as compared to the uh, contralateral descended side. And because of this then, the undescended testicle was noted to have a significantly lower number of the adult, uh, uh, adult dark spermatogonia as compared to the contralateral um, descended testicle. But there could be, uh, they also, um, identified that there could be an over uh, sort of a, a, um, a systemic issue in the fact that if you look at the disappearance of gonocytes, so typically this occurs by six months of age in a boy with two fully descended testicles. But what they found is that this was um, delayed in both the unascended testicle as well as the contralateral descended testicle. And so they felt that there could be a systemic hormonal issue in these boys which could account for this. And again, this is all within the first year of life. If you look at um, the, these same boys as they started to get older, um, and this included boys anywhere from two to nine um, years of age, you can see up here that the primary uh, spermatocyte counts was significantly lower than in the, um, in the undescended testicle as compared to the contralateral descended testicle then. So here the um, undescended testicle is represented then by the, by the um, dots, whereas the um, descended testicle is represented then by the squares. And so this may mean that, that um, as they, uh, that the, 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 the step of going through that first part of meiosis then may not be occurring properly in these boys then with the um, undescended testicle. And again, uh, they also identified that the germ cell counts were significantly lower in the, in the unascended testicle side as compared to the contralateral descended side then, meaning that there can be some effect um, on spermatogenesis um, on, in the, uh, especially in the undescended side. If we look at um, uh, the, the, uh, the, the studies and looking at adult sperm density then in um, adult, in adult men with a history of an unascended testicle, um, what we find is that um, in terms of the men with a history of a unilateral unascended testicle, the majority of these actually have normal sperm density, uh, whereas a, you know, only about 9% of these men actually have less than 5 million sperm. But it's really the, the men with a history of bilateral unascended testicles which seem to be profoundly affected and at least in this study, over 50% of them were found to have less than 5 million sperm. But if you look at the percentages and in terms of normal mortality as well as morphology, there really didn't appear to be an effect. If we look at hormonal levels then, um, so this is a study where they um, compared, again, men with a history of bilateral unascended testicles um, to unilateral unascended testicles. You can see that if you combine them, Really and truly, the only thing that they find is that there was a significant effect then on the um, inhibit levels. But um, although the study only included eight men, there seemed to be a profound effect on their inhibit levels as well as their FSH and their LH levels then, and also a, a reduced um, amount of testosterone as well. The study also looked at, looked at the effect of orchidopexia, or excuse me, the timing of orchidopexia as well as the testosterone levels in these, in these men, and they found an inverse relationship then between the age of orchidopexy and the testosterone levels then, and also found that um, men who had an orchidopexy performed at a younger age had um, a, uh, a greater inhibit B level as well as um, a lower FSH level. So there can be some effects, I think, on, on the uh, adult um, uh, you know, the semen analysis as well as their hormone levels. But at the end of the day, we have to figure out what this means. And so uh, this is sort of a follow-up study which, which came out of CHOP. And the purpose of this then was to 
um, correlate testicular histopathology at, at, at the time of orchid epoxy then to future fertility potential then. So they were able to recruit 91 patients with a history of an undescended, uh, unilateral undescended testicle and 19 men with bilateral, uh, excuse me, history of bilateral undescended testicle. And basically what they did is they got semen analysis on these men as well as hormonal levels and after they turned 18 years of age and um, wanted, to, wanted to correlate this then with his, histopathology at the time of the orchid epoxy. And really and truly at the end of the day, they, have, they identified no significant changes in hormonal levels or adult uh, semen analysis results based upon the histopathology at the time of the orchid epoxy then. So that means that maybe despite finding these changes in the histology then of the testicle and even the contralateral um, descended testicle at the time of orchid epoxy, it, it may not have any long-term um, effects on the semen analysis as well as the hormone levels in, in men as they get older. And really and truly the, the most important thing to look at is, is whether or not these men are able to um, have children as they get older. And this was, you know, uh, uh, there were multiple studies done out of Pittsburgh then uh, by Dr. Lee who, who sort of evaluated boys with a history of an unascended testicle. And really and truly uh, uh, what he identified, so what, he, what this one of his studies included was over 1,400 boys then which included 700, over 700 controls then who never had an unascended testicle, about 600 boys with a history of a unilateral unascended testicle, and 88 boys with a history of bilateral unascended testicles. And what he found was that um, in, in comparing the men with a history of a unilateral unascended testicle and the controls, there really was no significant difference. So uh, a very high proportion of these uh, of men in both cohorts were able then to uh, father children. However, there was a significant difference as seen here in men with a history of bilateral unascended testicles. He further evaluated the uh, men with a history of an, a unilateral unascended testicle and identified that there was no difference in comparing these men to the controls in terms of the number of um, months needed to attempt to father children. Uh, there was also no difference when they stratified them by the timing of the orchid epoxy as seen here, and also no difference when they stratified them by the location of the unascended testicle as well as the testicular size. So what this means is at the end of the day, despite possibly having some changes in the semen analysis, despite possibly having some changes in the hormone levels, in men with a history of a unilateral unascended testicle, they have a very high likelihood of being able to father children where it's the men with the history of the bilateral unascended testicles that I think we really have to be concerned about. Skipping gears here a little bit, we'll transition then to the relationship between um, an unascended testicle and a testicular cancer development. So in the general population, then the risk of developing testicular cancer is anywhere from 0.3 to 0.7%. To in men with a history of an unascended testicle, their lifetime risk is definitely higher at about three to 5% then. So that's about a four to seven fold increased risk then with an overall risk of about 4.8. And we know that in, in men with a history of testicular cancer, about five to 10% of these men will have had an unascended testicle. Um, if you're gonna develop a testicular tumor, it, it occurs and you got a unilateral unascended testicle. This occurs most commonly then in the affected side, but it's, it's important to note that it may also occur in the contralateral testis and the relative risk of developing testicular cancer in the contralateral testicle um, is, is increased as compared to the general population. So counseling these patients after undergoing an orchid epoxy, you need to make sure that they understand that the orchid epoxy did not alleviate this risk and that as they go through puberty, self-testicular examinations are important and the other thing too is that the location of the testicle, um, if a testicle is intra-abdominal as compared to uh, a, a inguinal unascended testicle, the intra-abdominal unascended testicle also has an increased risk for developing testicular cancer. Um, this study was a meta-analysis then trying to uh, evaluate the exact relative risk then for developing testicular cancer in men with a history of unascended testicle. This included um, nine case control studies and three cohort studies then for um, over 200,000 boys then. Of these, about 345 uh, actually uh, went on to develop testicular cancer. 
And so you can see here then that the overall relative risk then was about 2.9. So that boys with a history of an unassisted testicle are about three times more likely than to develop um, testicular cancer. In terms of the age of the orchid apexy and the risk of developing testicular cancer, this was a study out of, of Sweden then where they evaluated almost 17,000 men um, who underwent an orchid apexy before 20 years of age. And they followed these men um, for around 12 years then uh, with, with a large number of person years you can see in terms of them following. And what they found is they found uh, is in this, in this cohort, uh, 56 men um, actually developed testicular cancer, uh, which compared to the general population, your expected um, a rate of developing testicular cancer was around 20 cases then. Uh, but if you look here then, so the relative risk um, of developing testicular cancer in a boy who underwent an orchid apexy after 13 years of age was almost twice that if they underwent the orchid apexy before 13 years of age. So there seems to be an important cutoff value here, um, more than likely then as the boy starts to go through puberty, if the testicle remains undescended and then you proceed with an orchid apexy, there is an increased risk for them developing testicular cancer. And again, something important then to counsel these patients on. In terms of the risk of developing testicular torsion, um, in boys um, prior to undergoing an orchid apexy, there is about a 10 times higher risk than to, for developing testicular torsion. And unfortunately, there's a low salvage rate in these boys just because it's difficult to uh, appreciate and, and oftentimes there is a diagnostic delay um, in, in getting to these children. We'll quickly touch upon different ways to manage an undescended testicle, um, uh, just touching upon um, sort of the, uh, the success rates of these different therapies. So in terms of treatment, you obviously can observe these um, individuals waiting for spontaneous descent. Hormonal therapy is another option. And then surgical therapy um, with these different uh, approaches and our other options as well. Um, if you uh, look at sort of observation and spontaneous descent, there's varied reports in the literature, but generally, I, you know, we believe around three quarters of these patients may spontaneously descend. Again, if that's going to occur, it typically will occur by three to four months of age and is pretty rare after six months of age. And, and to sort of touch upon this, this was a study um, done out of the University of Michigan. They wanted to um, determine then the rate of spontaneous descent um, in boys after referral for, to them for an unascended testicle. And what they identified then is, is, um, is that in boys who, who they have first evaluated between um, zero and two months of age, about a quarter of them uh, did spontaneously descend. At about two to four months of age, about 20% of them descended. After four to six months of age, it was rare, with only about 7% of the boys spontaneously descending. And this can be seen on this part of the slide. Uh, however, though, in the individuals then who they evaluated after six months of age, none of them spontaneously descended. And so this would be a reason then to move on uh, to surgery then with these boys um, with the uh, persistent undescended testicle. In terms of hormonal therapy then for an undescended testicle, you can either administer HCG or LHRH then, there's really varied success rates that in, in terms of studies looking at um, administering this. And there's really a, a multiple confounding variables in many of these studies. Um, again, um, this group, uh, uh, which performed the meta-analysis then, um, they evaluated the um, hormonal therapy for the treatment of an unsent testicle. And as you can see here through multiple studies, um, despite the different ages, that the, the strength of evidence and the magnitude of effect is sort of all over the board and very low. And so because of this, then uh, the, in the AUA guidelines, and they recommend that hormonal therapy should not be used as a treatment then um, for uh, a, a child with an unascended testicle. In terms of um, primary orchid apexy, again, we all know that this carries a very high success rate, again, demonstrated in this meta-analysis then Overall, there's a very low um, risk of developing atrophy after a primary inguinal orchid apexy. And because of this, then the AUA guidelines, again, I recommend that if they, uh, a child is found to have a persistent unascended testicle, that they should undergo an orchid apexy. Pretty straightforward there. In terms of uh, children who have undergone a Fowler-Stevens orchid apexy, there's um, 
you know, varied success rate, and it appears that um, in, in boys who underwent a uh, one-stage orchid effects, they have a slightly, or a, 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 a little, um, in terms of success rates, it's a little bit less as compared to um, boys who undergo a two-stage Fowler-Stevens approach. Um, in addition, then uh, boys who undergo a, a one-stage, then they do have a little bit higher risk then for developing testicular atrophy as seen here. Uh, but overall, then again, in this meta-analysis, then um, you know, relatively reasonable in terms of success rates. Laparoscopic orchid apexy um, carries a, a, a success rate of around 74% if it's performed in a single stage and a little bit lower if performed in a Fowler-Stevens approach then um, uh, with a, a little bit of a varied testicular uh, risk of developing testicular atrophy as well. In terms of timing of the orchid apexy then, um, uh, this, this, this group um, actually compared um, the growth of, an, of a unilateral unascended testicle if an orchid apexy was performed at nine months versus three years of age then. The way that they calculated that is, it, is that they measured the testicular volume of both the descend, uh, unilateral uh, unascended testicle as well as the contralateral descended testicle at 6, 12, 24, 39, and 48 months then. These boys were um, randomized then to either undergoing the orchid apexy at nine months versus um, three years. What they found is that, um, you can see right here, is that, if you, is that in evaluating the uh, descended testicle, there was no difference in terms of the rate of growth of, of the unilateral, un, unilateral descended testicle in boys um, who, who are either in the early surgery group versus the late group. So that means that this testicle grows no matter what. However, if you look down here, those boys that um, uh, were in the early orchid apexy group, originally that testicle was um, smaller in size, but over time it seemed to catch up in, in terms of um, growth. So the, at the end, it was comparable then to the contralateral descended testicle. However, in the late orchid apexy group, this catch-up growth never, never occurred. And so because of this, oops, um, you know, early surgery then may certainly be quite beneficial. Um, and then what, what, what may cause uh, these testicles to be a little bit smaller? Um, this study evaluated that. And what they found is that um, over time is that is that it, the children who underwent um, an orchid apexy at a later age actually had an increased risk for, for um, germ cell loss then. Certainly that can result in testicular volume loss, which could be seen in the prior study. And because of this, again, in the AUA guidelines then, um, uh, for boys then who, where the testicle has not spontaneously descended by six months of age then, again, they recommend moving forward with um, an orchid apexy then. And that, that seems to make good sense then in order to preserve the testicular volume or allow catch-up growth then of these um, affected testicles so that they can match uh, the contralateral side. So um, we'll conclude this here. So, you know, in conclusion then, we, we all understand that uh, an undescended testicle is a very common problem. It's been recognized then um, for quite some time then. And in order for a testicle to spontaneously descend, then there are multiple factors then which um, are necessary then for its proper descent. And there's probably multiple factors which are still undiscovered, um, uh, which, which you know, are a mystery uh, to date then, which, uh, you know, in, in order to allow a, a testicle to spontaneously descend. In terms of the impact of having an undescended testicle, certainly we see that there can be some impaired maturation of germ cells, which may even occur on the contralateral descended side then. But at the end of the day, then paternity, at least in boys with a history of a unilateral undescended testicle that does not appear to be affected. Um, and it's really the boys with the bilateral undescended testicles, which we have to be uh, concerned about then. And in addition, then there is an increased incidence of testicular cancer in both the uh, undescended side as well as the descended side if we're looking at boys with a history of a unilateral undescended testicle. And if possible, then we should try to get to these boys before they reach the age of 13 or puberty then to try to minimize that risk. In terms of evaluation of these boys, then certainly this should occur at every well-child visit. 
imaging, as we all know, then should never be uh, performed. Treatment, um, we know that spontaneous descent is unlikely to occur after four months of age. Um, and so in, in these boys, then surgery should be um, our treatment of choice. Really hormonal therapy is sort of all over the board and is never recommended then. And in all of these uh, boys, we're trying to uh, position the testicle within the scrotum properly to try to, um, uh, to, try to um, allow proper testicular, testicular development. But it's important then to keep in mind that this does not eliminate the long-term risks of infertility as well as testicular cancer development. Um, so with that, I will um, take any questions. And also then, um, uh, this is um, a slide then for you to share your thoughts then by, by, by taking this survey as well. So uh, let me punch up here then to see if I can um, uh, pull up some of the questions here. Um, let's see, so number one of the, one of the questions was, uh, do you take in all cases a biopsy at the same time of an orchidopexy to check um, the um, AD spermatogonia then? And what is your experience in treatment before the surgery with HCG and LHRH to improve the spermatogenesis? So um, uh, in, in terms of my practice, I typically do not uh, biopsy the testicles. This isn't something that's I think routinely performed nowadays in the United States then. Um, in terms of administering these hormonal agents then before, um, uh, before surgery, again, that, that's not something that, that I routinely do. I know that there are some um, folks out there who will do this then thinking that uh, you know, later on in life this may help with um, uh, some of the uh, semen analysis parameters. And I think there was a recent um, paper in the Journal of Urology looking at this. Uh, again, I think this is, is a bit um, um, un, un, unproven as well. Um, the next question is, uh, do you take a serum level of uh, FSH uh, in, inhibit B to diagnose hyper hypergonadic hypogonadism? Again, that's not something that I routinely do, but again, I think that there was a recent paper in the Journal of Urology where they discussed doing that and then based upon that, um, possibly administering um, um, uh, LH or, uh, uh, LHRH or HCG to try to, to, try to, um, uh, to, try to stimulate uh, spermatic development. Uh, again, I think that, that that's sort of hit or miss in terms of that practice. Um, there was a question here, uh, do you perform a scrotal orchidopexy and is it dependent on, upon the pre-op testicular position? I know that there are um, um, a fair number of individuals out there who, um, and I'm not sure if you're talking about approaching an inguinal testis through a scrotal approach. I know that there are a large number of individuals out there who will, um, who will uh, 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 do this. And again, I think it's just dependent upon your technique then. Um, for some individuals, I don't think it depends upon your preoperative testicular position. Um, I think they approach all sort of standard um, inguinal unascended testicles um, through this approach. Um, let's see. The next was, do you cut the gubernaculum when doing a Fowler-Stevens procedure? Uh, do I always do a two-stage procedure? Um, and is it dependent upon the intra-abdominal position of the testicle? Um, so typically, um, I, if I'm doing a Fowler-Stevens, I try to do it in one stage. Um, unless I do a laparoscopic two-stage Fowler-Stevens. Um, when I'm doing a, a laparoscopic approach, if I take a look in the abdomen and the, and the testicle is quite high, you know, those are, those are patients that I will two-stage. So I'll divide the spermatic vessels and then come back six to 12 months later then in order to bring the um, testicle down. Uh, but typically if I'm able to uh, uh, find the testicle um, within the inguinal canal and I feel that I need to do a um, a Fowler-Stevens, I try to do this in one stage. Uh, and typically what I'll do before I divide the spermatic vessels is place a bulldog clamp on the spermatic vessels then to see if the testicle may survive without the spermatic vessels. If, it, if, if the testicle doesn't become dark, then, then I will take the spermatic vessels 
Um, if it seems viable, uh, then that's what I do. Um, otherwise, if it doesn't appear viable, then uh, we may uh, approach this in a, in a two-stage approach. Um, there was a question about um, using beta HCG stimulation test if you have uh, bilateral non-palpable unascended testicles. Um, you know, I, I think that this is certainly possible. Um, that being said, uh, it's not something that I routinely do. And uh, typically I just proceed with a, a laparoscopic orchid apexy then in order to evaluate um, uh, the abdomen to identify, to see if we can identify the testicles. Uh, but I don't think you'd be faulted if you um, wanted to do the HCG stimulation test. Although I think that there is some, uh, there is a, um, a false positive rate with that test. And so because of that, then typically I'll approach these then just through a uh, laparoscopic approach. Let's see, how do you manage bilateral abdominal testis? Um, uh, let's see, it says side by side or both at the same time. You know, typically, um, again, this is something that I do laparoscopically. Um, and as long as the testicles are um, lower, meaning that, they're, that we identify them uh, within the abdomen, sort of close to the internal um, ring, um, then I, I don't have any problem doing this, uh, do, taking care of both testicles um, at the same time. And, you know, um, anecdotally, I can say that I um, had reasonable success with this. But I, I, again, I think it just sort of depends upon your comfort level then. Um, in terms of my recommendations then for um, uh, orchid apexy after an ingual hernia repair um, or, or for a secondary orchid apexy, I, I know that there are some individuals who advocate approaching this through a scrotal approach. Um, I've tried that and, and basically what you're doing is you're freeing up the scar um, from around the testicle. And I just don't feel like if you approach this just from a scrotal approach that you're gonna be able to free up all the necessary scar. And I, and I feel like you're just gonna be coming back to doing, to, to repeating the surgery. Um, so typically what I do is I typically, you can find the testicle within the scrotum. So I, I begin by making a scrotal incision, go down and find the testicle, sort of get control of the testicle, and then move up to the inguinal canal uh, excuse me, an inguinal incision, come down um, through the uh, inguinal canal. And then by controlling the testicle to, through the scrotum, you can uh, then identify the spermatic vessels um, and open up the fascia if necessary. And then you're basically sort of freeing up the scar from around the spermatic vessels and the vas deferens. Um, and I found this to be um, a nice approach then for making sure that you're not you know, that you're, that you're doing this safely and you, you, and you can identify those um, structures then while you're doing this redo procedure then. Um, let's see, in terms of the patient with an abdominal unness and a testicle who comes in for the first time at adolescence, do I offer him orchidopexy versus orchiectomy? Um, I usually just move forward then with offering them an orchidopexy. I tell them at the time of the procedure, if we identify that the testicle just doesn't appear viable, or is very atretic then, then we may very well um, uh, remove the testicle. Uh, but that being said, if the testicle looks, looks reasonable, then I bring it down to the, um, to the scrotum um, and uh, definitely um, harp on those patients afterwards then to make sure that they understand the need then to do self-testicular examinations. Um, and then it's, the next question will be given the data if the boy presents at an or puberty with an undescent testicle, would you recommend biopsy during orchid apexy to assess the risk for malignancy? Again, typically this isn't something that I um, have routinely done. Um, and I'm, um, I'm not sure, it, you know, it, especially if they're not yet through puberty, that that would be um, really all that helpful then. So I, I, I don't think this is necessar necessarily advocated then. And then what do you think about performing Fowler Stevens orchid apexy in all intra-abdominal testis? It says that this is done in some centers in the UK. Um, again, I think it all depends upon your um, comfort level then in performing a Fowler-Stevens uh, versus just a, um, a standard orchid apexy. And again, in my hands, usually this is when we're, when we're dealing with um, intra-abdominal unascended testicles, which I typically approach through a, a laparoscopic approach. And um, 
And uh, again, I think it just depends upon your comfort level. I know that some are more comfortable always performing a follower Stevens approach where, you know, I think that if you can do this in a single stage and get it down to the scrotum, um, then that is certainly um, a good option as well. So with that, it looks like it's seven o'clock. Um, again, I'd like to thank you guys for all tuning in. Um, hopefully this was uh, helpful. I appreciate any feedback from all of you and, um, and, and please have a good night and uh, stay safe. Thanks so much.